didn't really survey. And so uh, as I woke up this morning, I thought, well, the thing to do is to get the survey of the prophets in the Sunday school hour and then take up a particular passage or two in the message of the sermon uh, out of the prophets. Now, one of the things to recognize in the development of the Old Testament uh, itself is that there were a series of prophets that did not leave any writ written material. Uh, Elijah and Elisha would be examples. No written material by them. They did not leave books to us. Uh, what you have, of course, is the division of the kingdom after Solomon's period. And uh, you have the northern kingdom that began to defect earlier than the southern kingdom did. And uh, what God does, and as you study this and look at it overall, that despite their defection, and during the time of their worst defections uh, under uh, Ahab and, and Jezebel, for example, what, was, what did Jezebel do? She was a, a princess from a pagan land that worshiped Baal, and she introduced Baal worship into Israel, the northern kingdom. It was to become the official religion of Israel in the northern kingdom. And so God raised up Eli Elijah to stand against that and to bring the people back. You see, it's part of God's gracious mercy in which he, despite their, their waywardness as a people, that God graciously kept his prophets before them, kept the message before them that uh, Jehovah, he is God. You remember the Mount Carmel e experience as he, he and has the Baal of prophets build their altar and, and so forth, and then he builds his altar, and then they, they go all morning and cannot get fire to come upon the altar. And then Elijah simply has, he has his covered with water, trench around it with water all around it, and he makes a simple prayer that God would show that he is God. And as he does, the fire comes and it consumes the, the, the sacrifice of the altar itself and licks up all the water. And uh, the people begin to shout, Jehovah, he is God. And here again, that use of the word Jehovah, you see, is the personal name that the Israelites, you see the word Baal means Lord. And Jehovah is translated in our King James Version, for example, or in your modern versions as Lord. And you don't get the full impact of that. But if you keep, have the, the Hebrew name, Jehovah, he is God. That, that was one of the things that people came to recognize. And then you have Elijah fleeing from, from uh, the, the uh, Jezebel was not satisfied at all. Of course, Elijah had the Baal priests uh, there killed, and uh, she sets out to, to seek Elijah's life, and Elijah flees, and eventually passes on his mantle to Elisha. And Elisha, still ministering to the northern kingdom, both of these prophets were prophets to the northern kingdom. And what you have is, is the fact that the kingdom doesn't hear. The people as a whole do not hear the message. And so their ministry, something of their ministry is recorded in the historical writings of, of the historical books. And by the way, the, the, in the arrangement of the Hebrew uh, scriptures, the historical books fall along with the prophets. You have Moses, the fi first five books, the prophets, including the historical books and the books of the prophets, and then the writings, which start with the Psalms, the Book of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and uh, the, the, what we call the wisdom literature, as well as the Psalter. So those are the ma major divisions of the Old Testament. But what you, as you look at the history of the development of this, there were these various prophets during that period. Nathan had been a prophet to David. You remember he gives him the prophecy about the fact that there will be one upon his throne forever. Uh, but he leaves no writing uh, other than the historical books. Historical books probably were, were basically written by these uh, relatively unknown prophets of that period. Uh, and, but they do not, during that period, leave us any written materials as you have in the latter half of the, of the prophetic books. Now, what becomes evident, especially as the northern kingdom is finally taken away in 722 B.C., uh, Samaria is taken off by Assyria. 
and uh, the people there, the, Ju the Israelites of the northern kingdom, is taken off into Assyria, and others brought in and placed in their place. Uh, this was the way in which the kingdoms did this. They thought that they would perpetuate their kingdom if we displace these people from where their, their land and where they've got loyalties and so forth, displace them to another place, bring in other people into their place, and they won't have those loyalties to the land anymore, and therefore we'll perpetuate our kingdom. And so that was the way in which some of these ancient kingdoms operated. And the northern kingdom then essentially uh, taken away in 722. Uh, you have several of the prophets uh, that ministered to the northern kingdom. Uh, you begin to have the writ written prophets or the writing prophets because it's evident that they are not going to hear the message in their own generation. And what you have in the whole books of the writing prophets, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah on the, are the major prophets, as we call them, and then the others, the minor prophets, the, the smaller writings, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, etc. Uh, and as you study those prophecies as a whole, Virtually all of them have reference either to the Messiah himself or to the Messianic age. They talk about the coming of the day of the Lord. And uh, so you can find either direct references to, to the Christ or, to, or references to the effect of his coming. What's the kingdom of God going to be like? So you have, in a sense, what you'd say would be an Old Testament eschatology looking down towards the New Testament era. And one of the major things that they have in the Old Testament eschatology is the fact that they are looking for a Messiah. And along with that, the change that he's going to bring, uh, the kingdom of God theme that, and that phrase, by the way, does not appear in the Old Testament, the kingdom of God, except perhaps in one place. Uh, so that theme itself is not such a major thing. But when you come John the Baptist, kingdom of God is at hand. In Jesus' ministry, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they began preaching on the kingdom of God out of that Old Testament eschatology that had the idea of the Messiah as king. And so they were looking forward to the Messiah and his kingdom. And you find, as I say, a series of references in these prophets of the Old Testament. And let me just sort of page down through uh, the minor prophets. Uh, Hosea, for example, Hosea, you remember, is the prophet that has, is, is commanded to marry uh, one who is an adulteress. And then he is to, even though she divorces him and so forth, she, he eventually takes her back. And he's the picture of God loving his people, despite our unfaithfulness, of God loving his people. And he names the children of, the, of that marriage, uh, Lo Ami, no, not my people. And then eventually it changes, drops the low, the not, and becomes my people. And that's part of the message of Hosea. Hosea, in a sense, is the, is the counterpart to the Gospel of John. It's the prophecy of love. And uh, chapter 11, 1 is a particular prophecy that actually is referred to the Messiah, though on the first reading of it, we might think that it isn't referring to the Messiah. When Israel was a child, when I then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now you remember when Jesus, when Joseph and Mary take Jesus down into Egypt to escape from Herod, uh, and, and his successors, uh, this, act, this passage is actually pro, uh, uh, quoted by the New Testament as being fulfilled in that. But what's it talking about? On the surface, the people that Hosea heard, or, or, or was speaking to and, and what he no doubt was thinking of is when Israel was a child as a nation, brought them out in the Exodus. I called my son out of Egypt. And yet the New Testament now gives us a deeper and fuller meaning that Israel, that son of God, as it were, that God called out of Egypt, out in the Exodus, was but a foreshadowing of the son of God who would be called out of Egypt. And so Jesus actually is taken down into Egypt as an infant and is brought back uh, subsequently and taken back to Nazareth. And so Hosea, you have that, that particular 
references, and it may, may well be others as well, but uh, we just are surveying and trying to pick up a few uh, high points. The prophecy of Joel, and what, it's interesting, we don't know exactly when Joel prophesied. Uh, the fact that it's early in the books of the minor prophets, and that's true in the he Hebrew listing as well, suggests he was an earlier one of these prophets, not later, but before the, these, uh, the, the fall of Samaria and the fall of Jerusalem. Joel is talking about, among other things, the coming of the day of the Lord. And the classic passage that we look to that Peter preached on at Pentecost is found in Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall dream dreams, and your, uh, and your young, uh, uh, and, uh, the old men shall dream dreams, and the young men shall dream, uh, see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, if you'll turn to the second chapter of Acts, you'll find Peter quotes that exactly. And he says that the event of Pentecost was the fulfillment of this prophecy. And you see, that's part of the messianic picture that is coming, that this is going to happen, and God's going to usher in a period in which the Spirit of God now is going to come not just upon the leaders. And by and large, the picture of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament was to come partic upon particular individuals, prophets, or the kings and so forth to empower them to do their, perform their office. Now, we in the New Testament era, all of us, who know the Lord Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit has changed our hearts, and more than that, he's come to dwell within us. And so Pentecost is the baptism of the church that's announced here in the prophecy of Joel. Uh, Amos, again, you have uh, uh, the, a general prophecy that in which here's a prophet out of the southern kingdom going up to the northern kingdom and prophesying against them and the fact that they are going to have a fall uh, I picked up just uh, one of the passages in chapter 9 uh, where, where it speaks not so much of the Messiah but the result of his work. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up its ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. You know when that's quoted? It's quoted in the Acts 15, Jerusalem Council. And the issue was, shall the Gentiles be allowed to enter into the church uh, without first being circumcised and become Jews and then accept the Jewish Messiah? And Paul argues for, and, is, and they're persuaded of, no, it's a gospel of grace alone, not grace plus works, but a, salvation is by grace alone. And the promise then of the Gentiles being gathered in is part of the building up of the tabernacle of David. We might think, no, that's especially Jewish in character. And yet that's what is quoted in, in, by the, in the Council of, Jerus of Jerusalem in Acts 15. This passage is quoted as being fulfilled in the gathering in of the Gentiles into the church. Uh, Jonah, uh, Jesus, in Matthew 12, maybe you ought to turn to that one, Matthew 12, verses 39 and following, tells us, I think, the real significance of the book of Jonah. Uh, Jesus, uh, Matthew 12, 39. Well, let me start with 38. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And there you see the first point of significance of the book of Jonah is pointing to the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Jonah was, in all intents and purposes, dead in the, in the belly of the whale. Now, we don't believe he died, literally, but he saw himself in the grave. You read that second chapter of Jonah. It's a, it's a, a psalm, as it were, of one who is caught up in, the, in dying. And then he's cast forth on the third day by the, by the whale. And uh, Jesus says, this is a picture of the coming of the Son of Man 
and his death and resurrection. And then the second point that he makes about the book of Jonah in verse 41 of Matthew 12, the men of Nineveh shall stand up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented uh, at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And so Jesus points to Jonah and sees the significance of Jonah, first the reference, the pointing to the death and resurrection of the Messiah, and then also to the fact that uh, Nineveh, that city, that Gentile city, it was the capital of Assyria, that Gentile city had repented when Jonah came through and saying, God's going to bring a judgment against this city. And you remember the king put sackcloth and ashes on and, and everybody. And God didn't send the judgment at that time. And here you see then that the fact that uh, they repented and they become an example of the Gentile repentance that comes uh, after the uh, Messiah comes. And he points out that Jews were not as repentant as the men of Nineveh, that the men of Nineveh will stand against you. Uh, Micah, Micah contemporary to Isaiah. And we want to get back into Isaiah and look at that more fully. But Micah, a contemporary to Isaiah in particular, when uh, Herod says, where is the Messiah going to be born? When these wise men come and say, we have seen a star. And they, they frightened the people there in Jerusalem. They didn't know what they were talking about. And Herod figured it must be some messianic prophecy. And so he says, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? And they searched the scriptures and they came up with Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, art, which art little to be among the thousands of Judah, out of thee shall come forth unto me uh, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And there you see the picture of the coming of the Messiah. He's to be the king. And he's one who is eternal. His going forth are of old, from everlasting. He's not just a human figure. He's a figure who's going to be born in Ju Jerusalem. He will be a man, but he also is more than a mere man. And so you have the designation particularly of Bethlehem in Micah 5.2 uh, as a messianic prophecy. Uh, as you move on down past the time of the, the exile, uh, Haggai uh, talks about uh, the, the uh, let me see, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and following. For thus saith Jehovah, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations, and the precious things of all the nations shall come. That's the gathering of the Gentiles from all the nations. This is part of the Messianic age. And uh, the precious things of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith Jehovah of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith Jehovah of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. Now, Haggai was involved with the rebuilding of the temple. Haggai and Zechariah involved with the rebuilding of the temple after the exile and the 70 years in exile, and they come back and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And the people are crying, oh, it's not as glorious as Solomon's temple. And here he's given the prophecy, the temple of the Lord's gonna be greater. And ultimately that temple is not the building, it's the church. Uh, in Ephesians 2, Paul speaks about the church being the temple of the Lord quickly turn to that, the last verses of that second chapter of Ephesians, and uh, he uses that figure about the, uh, about the church and, and that it is a temple being built in the Lord. Uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, verses 19 and following, So then ye are no more so strangers and sojourners, you Gentiles. You're no more strangers and sojourners, uh, but ye are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God being built upon the foundation. Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom each several building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. And so the church of which we are a part, not this building, but we as people are the bricks, as it were, that go in to make up the, the building blocks of this temple of the Lord. 
Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. The apostles and the prophets, the New Testament prophets and, and apostles were the, were the foundation stones. And once that foundation is laid, then now the church is being built and we each are, are fit, stones fitly framed together as Peter uses the same figure in 1 Peter 2. So the temple of the Lord is going to be more glorious, says Haggai, than that temple that they were rebuilding there. Zechariah has a number of passages that speak of the Messiah. Here's one that uh, is in the sixth chapter. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldai and Tobijah and Jediah, and then come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah the son of Zephaniah, whither they are come from Babylon. And what was happening was many of the Jews had not come from Babylon. They had not decided to uproot their families and did not return to Jerusalem. But they knew the temple was going to be built. And so they'd gathered offerings and sent gold and silver to be a means of helping to rebuild the temple. And so he says, you're to take of these people that have come from Babylon, yea, take of them silver and gold and make crowns. And the commentators vary on this was perhaps one of the crowns silver and one gold, to taking silver and gold, perhaps two crowns that fit together somehow. Make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. Now Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, was a priest. You're mixed up, Zechariah, if you're going to crown a priest. The king line, the kingly line comes down through Judah. But here you see the prophecy is that in the Messiah, you're going to have one who is both priest and king. The Messiah is going to perform both of those functions. Actually, he performs the third function as well, a prophet as well. And so he's to crown the Joshua and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Jehovah. It's the Messiah who's to build the, build the temple. This one called the branch. He's the builder of the temple. Even he shall build the temple of Jehovah, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. So this priest is to sit upon a throne. And he shall be priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be to held Helam and to, and to Tobijah and to Jediah and to Hen the son of Zephaniah for a memorial in the temple of Jehovah and they that are far off shall come and build in the temple. I think that's talking about us, Gentiles. We were far off. They that are far off shall come and build in the temple of Jehovah and ye shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you and this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of Jehovah your God. And as you look at the history of the church, as the church has been faithful, God has blessed her when she begins to lose the gospel as she did in the Middle Ages. God raised up reformers to seek to reform that church. And when she wouldn't be reformed, they cut, were cut off and formed the, what we call the Protestant churches. And then we've seen that in our own country. The Presbyterian churches planted on these shores was a great denomination. And then in this 20th century, she's drifted, drifted into liberalism and unbelief. And God has raised up out of the, that mother church, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church in America, the Bible Presbyterian Church, these various groups that have come out of the mother church. You see, it, God's going to do this thing, and we are going to participate in it only if we are faithful. And I would say PCA hasn't any ground to think where well, we are the faithful ones. Uh, we could very well see this, this denomination slide as well. And God raise up yet others who would be carrying forth and spreading this gospel. But here's the Messiah, the priest king, who is the one who is building the temple. And one of the commentators on it suggests that as priest, he, he is the one who has offered the sacrifice to cleanse and prepare the stones. And as king, he's the sovereign one who goes to the quarry and takes this stone and this stone 
and this stone and puts them into the building. He's the sovereign king, but it takes the priestly work to cleanse and prepare those stones, namely the washing away of their sins by the blood of the Savior. And so the com combination of the priest and the kingship together. Malachi, uh, the last book of the Old Testament, the last book of the Minor Prophets has uh, references to the Messiah. Behold, chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That probably is a reference to John the Baptist. He shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek will suddenly come to his temple. And you see that in the gospel. When Jesus comes in the beginning of the, of the gospel of John, he comes to the temple and he cleanses it. The Lord whom ye seek. You're seeking for this Lord, this Messiah, and he will come suddenly to the temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom ye desire, behold, he cometh, saith the Jehovah of hosts, but who can abide the day of his coming? That day as he came to the temple, he cleansed it, he judged it. And in the, ultimately, he, when he returns, he will be coming back as judge of the earth. And who can abide? Only those who know him as Savior and as Lord. And then the book ends, striking the Old Testament ends this way, the fourth chapter, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Here are the prophets. Now the liberals try to say where well, there are all sorts of different schools of thought and different, different theological groups and so forth, and they're in opposition to each other. The prophets were in opposition to the, to the priest and the law and so forth. Here's the prophet saying, remember the law. The unity of the Old Testament is declared here. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in, in Horeb for all Israel, even statutes and ordinances. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of Jehovah. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now that's quite clearly a prophecy uh, when you have the prophecy in the book of Luke with regard to the coming of John the Baptist. That's just what he's going to do. He's going to come and turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Part of the prophetic uh, pro prophecies concerning him, uh, the predecessor before the Messiah himself. So that's just a quick survey. Now I haven't talked about the major prophets and let me go back and try to pick up on that just briefly. Uh, and uh, Isaiah, of course, is the prince of the prophets. He was prophesying about a hundred years before the fall of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he saw the fall of Samaria, and uh, he was prophesying during that period. And he, his book is a book that is just full of messianic passages, uh, beginning with chapter 4. Uh, where he speaks about the, the uh, in verse 2, in that day shall the branch of Jehovah, now Zechariah, who f came later, you remember we've just read that prophecy, and he's uh, prophesying about Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and he says, behold the man whose name is the branch. This is where that language comes from. Uh, and he, this is remarkable in that this is the only place where this phrase is used. In that day shall the branch of Jehovah be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be excellent and comely for them, them that are escaped of Israel. Now the branch of Jehovah, you see if you look out and look at a tree here, a branch of that tree is of the same nature with the tree. So one who's called the branch of Jehovah is one who is of the same nature with Jehovah. He is divine. And this is a declaration of the coming of the Messiah under the terms of his deity and the fact that he is the branch of Jehovah. Now, elsewhere, he's going to be called the branch of the stock of David. And we'll see, be seeing his, more his uh, uh, human side dis disclosed there. So that fourth chapter begins with that sort of a passage. Uh, the seventh chapter, uh, which we'll be reading as our scripture text this morning, so as the, the verse 14, the uh, prophecy of the virgin birth, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And Matthew picks that up and says that's what occurred when Jesus was born. And uh, we won't stop to elaborate on this because I want to bring out some of this in the message this morning. But here is this child who is to be born of a virgin. The language here, uh, behold, this is not just an ordinary event of a, child, of a woman having a, a child. That's not something that you would say, behold, this is happening. But to talk about a virgin having a child, it's never happened before. And so the very language itself in the text points it to us to the fact that this is a remarkable event that's going to take place. In chapter 9, continuing still to talk about the child, and Dr. I can remember Dr. Will McElwain, who was one of our uh, pioneer missionaries, or his, his parents had been pioneer missionaries to Japan, and he'd been raised on the field, and one of the grand old men of the PCA as we were formed. But he told me about going to Japan as a missionary on shipboard, and a Jewish rabbi who was also going to Japan, and he started to talk to him about the virgin birth. And he recited this passage and said, and, well, why does he call that same child what he does in the ninth chapter? And the rabbi didn't refute him at all. He didn't have any answer. And I hope maybe he was converted, but, but uh, that, this is a remarkable thing to be seen. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, uh, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of the peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this. And here's this glorious passage, and all of the titles, as we we'll again get into it in the message this morning, all of the titles really are referring to him in terms of his deity, the wonder of a counselor, or mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of those have allusions to the deity of this one. Chapter 11, there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, a branch out of his roots, and here's that word branch now being applied to the line of David and the stock of Jesse. And the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him. How is, how is this one going to operate? He's going to be both God and man, but in his human nature, he operates under the influence of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Jehovah is going to rest upon him. You have that event taking place at the baptism with this visible sign of the Spirit coming upon him. And then the Spirit is the one who guides him and directs him throughout his ministry. You remember when the, when the Jews were saying that he, he was casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. He warns them, lest they commit the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, because it was by the power of the Spirit that he was casting out demons. And so uh, the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, uh, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. And this, his delight shall be in the fear of Jehovah, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither decide after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. And the peaceful picture that is seen in the next picture of the lion or the wolf and dwelling with the lamb and the leopard lying down with the kid and the calf uh, I think that's a picture not so much necessarily of some millennial age yet in the future, but the peace of God that comes to us, that we have a peace that is described by these figures of that which goes against the natural uh, things in the world, a peace that comes to us through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And this is the work of the Messiah to bring that sort of thing upon us. So... Uh, 
this picture of the coming of the Spirit of Jehovah upon this one who is to be the Messiah. Now, moving on in Isaiah, you, there may well be other passages that I could, could stop and pick up on, but let me move on to chapter 40. Um, what occurs and the reason the liberals cannot see the possibility of Isaiah having written the whole book is because they're seeing Isaiah living around 700 B.C. and the fall of Jerusalem is 586, 100 years later, you see. How can he make these prophecies about what happens 100 years after this? The liberal view is anti-supernatural. Liberalism wants to explain what you've got in the Bible by simply natural phenomena. And so they might see a man being a prophet of this sort that somebody might predict what's going to happen, for example, in all of this presidential election debate. Some one of our news commentators may predict exactly what court's going to say the right thing and how this thing's going to be solved. And he may, as it were, prophesy that, but he's prophesying out of facts that are known to him at this point and so forth. But here's Isaiah living 120 years before this event takes place, and he begins to prophesy about the return of these people 70 years later even. How can he? Only by the Spirit of God. And so the idea of splitting up the book of Isaiah because, well, this just doesn't fit with, with the person who's been prophesying up to this point. Must be a second Isaiah to have written this. No such figure in the Bible. One of the remarkable things, by the way, in that connection was uh, the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found a whole scroll of the book of Isaiah. And this was uh, dated to around 200 B.C. These scrolls were, were copied at about 200 B.C. The Jewish practice in general was, once a scroll had worn out and had been copied and they counted the letters to be sure that it was exactly precise. Once they were sure that they had a precise copy, they destroyed the old. Didn't think it was right to keep a worn out copy of the Bible of God's word the thing to, is you replace it with a brand new one and then you destroy the old and you have a gap. The earliest uh, manuscripts that we had of Isaiah before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered right at the time of World War II was about 800 AD. And now we've dated these Dead Sea Scrolls around 200 BC, a thousand years earlier. Remarkable thing about that scroll, and I was sitting in the professor, under a professor in the University of Michigan uh, in Near Eastern Studies, and he talked about it, and he said that uh, the column at the end of chapter 39 ends about three lines before the bottom. If there was a division, you would expect at least a new column. Chapter 40 begins those bottom lines. And he says, at least at 200 B.C., there was no concept of a second Isaiah. And I think that's exactly right. Uh, he went on to say, that's not quite orthodox. That is orthodox from the liberal viewpoint. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a remarkable testimony to the unity of the book of Isaiah. That the earliest scroll that we now have, a thousand years earlier than anything we had before, testifies to the unity of that book. Uh, and it's getting back not to Isaiah's time, 200 B.C., and Isaiah living 700 B.C., 500 years uh, separating them, at but at least the Jewish tradition of that period was not a division of the book, despite the remarkable change that takes place. Chapter 40 is a remarkable chapter. Um, I'm trying to think of who it was. One of the British prime ministers, earlier prime ministers, before he would make a speech in Parliament, would stop and read this chapter because it would raise his, his feelings of eloquence in such a way. And we don't have time to stop and read the whole chapter, but do it. Read it out loud. And it's a beautiful passage of, of Scripture. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, that he, she hath, been re hath received of Jehovah's hand double for all her, her sins. The voice of one that crieth, prepare ye in the wilderness the way of Jehovah, make level in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low. 
and the uneven shall be made level, and the rough places plain, and the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Jehovah hath spoken. And then it goes on to speak about the one that comes. Uh, the, the, in the picture, if you can think of Jerusalem, you know, uh, the Mount of Olives on the, on the eastern side is above Jerusalem. And here comes the herald with the message, comes across the top of that mountain and sounds the trumpet so the whole city can hear. Behold, messenger is coming. Behold, one is coming. And so in verse 9, O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, Get thee up on a high mountain, O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift up thy voice and strength, with strength. Lift, up, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Ju Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord Jehovah will come as a mighty one, and his arm will rule for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his recompense upon, before him. And here he's declaring that one who has come is going to be none other than God himself. And he's coming with all the power and authority of God. And in the very next words, the change of tone. And he will feed his flock like a shepherd. And he will gather the lambs with his arm, in his arms and carry them in his bosom. And he will gently lead those that have their young. And there's that tender picture of the Messiah. He's both the living God and the tender shepherd. And he gathers his flock and he gathers you and me as tender sheep and lambs that need his care and deals with us in tenderness and in mercy such so beautifully. You move on in this chapter. Chapter 42 begins a section of, of passages that are known as the servant passages. The servant picture in the book of Isaiah, uh, Alexander in his great commentary on, on the book of Isaiah, uh, says that we can understand the servant picture, think of it like a pyramid, and that the capstone is referring to the head, as it were. Well, we, the picture of Jesus, the head of the church, and then the, the lower part, all the body of the servants the reference to the servant may well be to both, the head and his body. When it's referring to the sinfulness of the, of the servant, it can't be to the head. It must be to the body alone. When it's referring to the redeeming work of the servant, it is to the head and not to the body. And so it's that sort of a figure. It isn't always perfectly clear, but the context has to determine which, which way you're speaking. But begin, beginning with Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. You see, that's more than just the people, not to the nation of Israel. That's talking about the Messiah. He's the one who's going to bring justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry, nor lift up his voice, nor cause it to be heard in the street. And here's this tenderness again. A bruised reed will he not break, and a dimly burning, burning wick will he not quench. He will bring forth justice in truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he have set justice in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. And we could go on reading the rest of that chapter Beautiful passage, let's just skip down to chapter, verse 10. Sing unto Jehovah a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth, ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof, thereof lift up their voices. The villages of Kedar uh, doth inhabit, uh, the, yet let the inhabitants of, the, of Selah uh, sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. It's the spread of the gospels of the world and the singing that the, the his coming is going to bring to the hearts of people. Moving on to chapter 44. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith Jehovah that made thee and formed thee from the womb, who will, who will uh, help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, 
For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and streams upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon the seed and my blessing upon, the, 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 upon thine offspring. You remember Jesus in the seventh chapter of, of John talks about the fact that he is the source of the water that, and we receive him and we'll not have to thirst anymore. And then John goes on to point out that he's talking about the Holy Spirit that's not yet given, not given until the time of Pentecost. And so this uh, referring to the coming of this, this one who is going to pour water out and quench our thirst. One shall say, I'm Jehovah's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto Jehovah, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith Jehovah the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts, I am the first and the last, uh, and besides me there is no God. And who, as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for, my, for me, since I established the ancient people and the things that are coming, uh, and that shall come to pass, let them declare. Fear not, ye, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have and not I declared thee unto thee of old and showed it unto thee, and ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no rock, and I know not any. And then he talks about the foolishness of the idolatry and so forth. And again, now I'm moving on in chapter 45, by the way, he talks about Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, who eventually sent the children of Israel back as the servant of the Lord. Uh, he wasn't necessarily a voluntary servant, but he was a servant of the Lord that God simply has sovereignty to pick up and use. Um, in the uh, 49th chapter, again, speaks about him uh, in the language, well, beginning with verse 5, And now saith Jehovah that formed thee from the womb, womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, uh, that Israel be uh, gathered unto him. For I am honorable in the eyes of Jehovah, and my God is become my strength. It's too light a thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the, restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that, they may, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And there the prophecy you see, the Messiah's work is not going to be just for Jews. It's going to include the whole world. Uh, and you have these remarkable passages in the Old Testament that the Jews didn't understand in Jesus' day. They were very much offended when he talked about the gospel going to the Gentiles. But this is exactly what you see unfolding in the book of Acts. Uh, the fact that the gospel began to spread to the Gentiles in that amazing way, and we are a part in the, uh, this uttermost part of the earth. We are a part of that church that he has gathered and called to himself. Chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. Announcement about the assurance of his work. He's going to do it and do it well. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Like as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man. On the one hand, you have this declaration of his victory and of his wisdom and the fact that he's going to do it right. And then he begins to describe this terrible picture of this one whose visage is so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. He's going to cleanse many nations through his suffering servant. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him for that which had, been, had not been told them shall they see and what, that which they had not heard shall they understand who hath believed our message to whom hath the arm of Jehovah been revealed for he grew up before him as a uh, root out of dry ground as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground he hath no form nor comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And that's the picture of the servant and, and the terrible condition that he was in in his, in his servanthood. 
And then he describes what was really happening. We esteemed him not, but what was really happening? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and Jehovah hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed yet when he was afflicted he opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter and a sheep that before its shearers is dumb so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generations, who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. When you think about that in regard to your own sinfulness, how could God be pleased to bruise his beloved son for you and for me, wicked sinners that we are? But that's exactly what the Bible says. It pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. So once he's made the offering for sin, then he sees his reward, the seed that has been given to him, and his people that are given to him, and he shall be the, in the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By the knowledge of himself shall my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, we really ought not stop reading, but our time is about up. But let me just read just a verse or two of the next chapter. What should be our attitude? Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the, of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith Jehovah. Enlarge the place of thy tent. This is the duty of the church today. Enlarge the place of thy tent. And what are we to do? Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen the cords. You, can, you know those tents in, in the Middle East. You lift up and go stretch it further out. You just add another room that way. Uh, the, you have the high pole, and then you keep on stretching it out further, and you can add another room to it. And so that's the picture here. Uh, stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. Lengthen them. Evangelize the world. Strengthen your stakes. Be sure you remain orthodox. I think that's the application we can make to the church today. For thou shalt spread abroad on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall possess the nations, and shall make desolate cities to be inhabited. Wish we had time to go on. I just, with time is up. 55th chapter talks about paying for things that are not worthy of anything. Ho, him that, ho everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come and buy and eat, yea, come by and eat wine and, and without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not? I mentioned Dr. McElwain, and I'll close with this. Dr. McElwain said as he came back from Japan on his furloughs that as he read this passage, he saw America falling into this sort of thing, spending our money for that which is not bread. He says, the word, as far as he was concerned, it was getting worse and worse and worse every time he came back. And we're in that affluent period, spending money for that which is not bread. Uh, help, let it, may we, 
each one embrace Jesus as our Savior, but then let's pass that word to the nation around us and to the nations around us, uh, the glory of this gospel. Let's close with prayer. Again, we thank thee, our Heavenly Father, for the prophets of the Old Testament and for the many prophecies concerning the Messiah and the Messianic age. Help us to understand and to grow in our knowledge of these things and bless these thoughts to our hearts now. Bless us as we move to the worship service that everything in that service will be done to thy glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.